depraved wretch, said he, now that at your death, the formidable gates of heaven, of hell, and a purgatory will alike be closed against your sinful soul. <laughs> my word, Shelley, did this dreadful author know? <laughs> Damn you, Byron, don't interrupt my reading. Where was I? Gates of hell, sinful soul, ah, here. You shall wander through this castle in the form of a ghost until some man, without being constrained or invited, shall... Oh, my word, it's Mark. Yes, without being invited, yes. Impeccable timing, as always. Oh, come and sit down, my learned friend. If I had a copy of your novel, The Monk, the most gruesome of tales, I'd be reading it instead. But uh, this will have to do. What are you talking about, Shelley? Shelley's been reading that marvelous collection of French ghost stories, translated into German. And then English. Obviously, Claire, yeah. It's Tales of the Dead, or Phantasmagore. Oh. Oh, Rihanna. Oh, my, sounds positively wicked. Well, what does this have to do with me? Uh, just listen, will you? <clears throat> you shall wander through this castle in the form of a ghost until some man, without being constrained or invited, shall do to you what you have so long done to and others. what was this spectre in life? What did he do to others? Shaved the pates. What? He was a barber. <laughs> a barber? Yes, a barber. Horrors, just like a ghost to shave a man bold. But I'm growing weary of the Shelley. This rain, will it never stop? I'm so bored. And besides, I've read all these stories before. And which is your favorite, my love? I don't know. They're all the same. The history of the inconstant lover, I suppose. Ah, uh, trying to communicate something to Claire? <laughs> what? <laughs> don't be silly, my lord. She has never listened to my warnings about you before. Why should she now? So tell us more about this inconstant lover. Oh, he thinks to clasp his bride to whom he pledged his vows, but he had deserted her, so instead found himself in the arms of her pale ghost. Sounds absolutely ghoulish. How can you ever sleep after reading such things? Oh, Mary never sleeps. Uh, don't be absurd. <laughs> Not when I'm in bed with you, you don't. <laughs> Oh, please. But I also like the tale of the patriarch, whose miserable doom it was to bestow the kiss of death on all the younger sons of his fated house, just as they reached the age of promise. <laughs> A story about my family. <laughs> his gigantic shadowy form, clothed like the ghost in Hamlet, in complete armor, but with the beaver up, was seen at midnight to advance slowly along the gloomy avenue. His shape was lost beneath the shadow of the castle walls, but soon a gate swung back. <laughs> a, a step was heard, and he advanced towards the couch of the blooming youths, cradled in healthy sleep. Eternal sorrow sat upon his face as he bent down and kissed the foreheads of the boys, who from that hour withered like flowers snapped upon the stalk. How horrid! How wonderful! Much more entertaining than the original. My God, beautiful and a storyteller too. I will make you my wife. First one got to die first. Oh, my Lord, you must say that thing. And why not? It's true, isn't it? But never mind. Your story, Mary, has given me an idea. Heaven help us. We're all writers here. Except for you, Dr. Polidori, but I dare say with a little help, even you can produce a trifle. Whatever you wish, my Lord. Oh, don't be so missish and take offense. You know how I am when I'm drunk. Oh, we all know how you are, George. But what's your idea? We will each write a ghost story. Heaven help us. But ghost stories are written again and again, if you'll excuse the pun, written to death. And you should know, Mr. Lewis, author of that renowned novel, destined to be a classic of the Gothic genre. Now, what is it called? I forget. The monk does a very good circulation, sir. I don't see there's any need to be insulted. Insulting? <laughs> I paid you a compliment. Ooh. Furthermore, your point is well taken. Ghost stories are so passé. I have an idea for a story not about the dead, but the dying. A story of someone enduring the pain of a horrible, painful death. If this talk continues, I should have to take to my bed. My skin is crawling. Sounds intriguing. Oh, not just skin, but George's idea. What did you start thinking of such a thing? I was reading Voltaire's History of the King of Sweden of all things. There's this delicious story about a foolish oh. Cossack caught in the throes of passion with a beautiful countess. Ah, I now understand your interest in the story. It's close to home. <laughs> <laughs> you minx. Yes, countesses I have known in Cossacks too. But I had the good sense to set sail from England when the train got too rough, didn't I? 
And yet, I do often wonder what it would be like to die horribly at the hands of angry men. And what happens after this caustic is apprehended? Ah, yes. The poor fellow is stripped naked and drugged behind his walls. Good God! Yes. I could see how that would make for an, an interesting story, but I know what would make it even better. Or worse, as the case may be. What could be worse? Not dying? Worse yet. He dies has fallen into a peaceful sleep of oblivion when he is snatched unwillingly back to life. Yes, yes, I think you've got something there, like those experiments with those creatures. Uh, what is it? Sounds like some kind of pasta. Vermicella. I remember. Uh, these creatures, Vorticella, they are called, can live only in water, but can be brought back to life after being dried out for days. Preposterous. Interesting. Like galvanism, reanimation using electricity. Uh, he did other experiments too. Isn't that right, Dr. Polidori? Uh, mixing water and paste together, then letting the flower sour in total isolation, away from the uh, flies and other insects. Then worms were spontaneously generated out of the paste. <laughs> oh, my worms. Ah! <laughs> ah, here it is. Proving that even the organic particles of dead animals may, when exposed to a due degree of warmth and moisture, do regain a degree of vitality. <laughs> Vorticella. Warmth and moisture. What are you laughing about, Doctor? This is pseudoscience, my lord. But you have to admit it would make a good story. Only if you can dispel their disbelief. Your ghost stories are so wildly popular because they're purely imaginary. <laughs> People can accept the mistruth in their own story precisely because they exist in the mind, merely symbolizing the horrors of real life. We all know there are no such things as ghosts. Mr. Lewis is correct. Science is here to enlighten us and our reason informs us. However, these stories are entertaining and writing one is a challenge I will accept. Heaven help us. Do you have a story in mind, sir? I do. It will be a morality tale, and like my lords, a horrible tale of punishment. The story of a skull-headed lady punished for peeping through a keyhole. Seeing something a young lady should never see. Precisely. Something very shocking and wrong, of course. But the woman's punishment would be purely supernatural. No one in today's modern world believes man can, or should, create life. <laughs> no, only women can do that. For a man of modern medical science, you sure have a lack of faith in your profession. Just think of it. Being able to bring a loved one back from the dead we would have such power to do good. Or evil. What do you mean? Nothing. No, no, no. You must say it now that you've begun, little one. Don't call me that. See the fire in her. There's no woman like her. Oh, please forgive me, my sweet. And tell me, tell us, what were you going to say? Only how supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. Success would terrify even one such as you, my dear, who claims he doesn't believe in omnipotence, except perhaps his own. I think it's time for you to retire, my dear. Yes, I thought you might think so. Mistress Mary isn't allowed to be contrary, is she? But never mind. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. Good night, gentlemen. What's the right thing for a woman to say now? Ah, oh, yes. Enjoy your port and your cigars. <laughs> oh, my. Fire, indeed. Just a dream. Don't be frightened. I'm not frightened. Not anymore. It was the storm. All that talk of death and dying, don't think of it. Come to bed. But I must think of it. Why? For God's sakes, it's just another stupid notion of George's. He gets so easily bored, that's all. Don't you see? I found it. I've dreamed it. What terrified me will terrify others. I need only describe this, this thing which haunts me. You're taking this much too seriously, my dear. Am I? Come to bed. Come to bed. I 
I want to write something that would speak to such mysterious fears, awaken such horrors, horrors to curl to the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. Oh, you always quicken the beatings of my heart. <sighs> now then go, silly girl. Write your ghastly dream down and get it out of your system. I'm going back to bed. It was a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. How could he explain his emotions, or describe the wretch that he, with such infinite pains and care, had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion, and he had selected the features to be beautiful. Beautiful. Great God, his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. Where am I? And where are we bound? You are on board the Archangel, Air Frankenstein. <coughs> I am Robert Walton, her captain. We are bound to the North Pole on a voyage of discovery. We found you on the ice, two days hence. You spoke to me then. Do you not remember, Air Frankenstein? Two days? You have been driving the strange <coughs> A sled drawn by dogs across the ice. Your limbs were half frozen when we found you. Why have you come so far in so strange a vehicle? To find a man. <coughs> and did this man travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we've seen him. For the day before we picked you up, we saw a man being drawn by dogs across the ice. What has become of him? I do not know. I must find out. It must be destroyed. It must be destroyed. I'll send one of my men to keep watch. But you must rest. They were nearly surrounded by ice. It closed in the ship on all sides, encompassed round by a thick white fog. They lay to, hoping that some change would take place in the weather. At about two o'clock, the mist cleared away, and they beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice which had no end. My dear sister, I said in one of my letters that I should find no friend on this wide ocean. Yet I have found such a friend in Victor Frankenstein. He is now much recovered from his illness. Although still unhappy, he interests himself deeply in the projects of others. He has frequently conversed with me on mine. Your aspirations are most noble, Captain Walton. I believe you will succeed in your endeavors. Your explorations will not only further science, but all of mankind. Thank you, Air Frankenstein. Do you know how gladly I would give up my life, my fortune, my every hope? One man's life or death would be a small price to pay for this acquirement of knowledge. Unhappy man, do you share my madness? What have I said? Forgive me, my friend. You have hope. Where there's life, there's hope, I've heard said. <coughs> Perhaps. You seek for knowledge in wisdom, as I once did. But have a care. I do not know what good telling you my story will do. But when I see you pursuing the same course, exposing yourself to the same dangers that <laughs> I would love to hear your story, but not now. Not at the expense of your illness getting worse. Not now that you are getting stronger. Do not waste your sympathy on me, my friend. My destiny is nearly fulfilled. I wait, but for one event. What? And then I may die in peace. <laughs> one. Nothing can alter my destiny. Listen. Only listen. His parents' oldest child was lavished with affection. During every hour of his childhood, 
he received a lesson of patience, of charity, and of self-control. All seemed but one train of enjoyment to him. When he was five, his mother visited a poor family to see how she could help. She found a peasant and his wife distributing a scanty meal to five hungry orphans, one of these with hair the brightest of living gold and cloudless blue eyes his sweet mother could not abandon to poverty. She came home to live with them. His mother named her Elizabeth. Two years later, a second son was born, Ernest, and then much later, William. No human beings could have passed a happier childhood than these three boys. Their parents were possessed by the very spirit of kindness and indulgence. Victor was also blessed with a friend like none other. Kind, devoted, a brother of his own age, his friend, Henry Clairvaux. Although Victor's temperament was sometimes violent, something about it turned his passion towards an eager desire to learn, especially natural science. As he observed human misery, his main desire became the discovery of the elixir of life. What glory would attend the discovery to banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death. He read widely about life after death. In thunderstorms, he saw the power of lightning to destroy. Could not that same power be harnessed for good? Then his mother caught a fever and died while nursing sweet Elizabeth. Her dying wish that Victor and Elizabeth be joined in marriage. But as his desire to reveal the secrets of life grew, he forgot everything, even Elizabeth. His passion to know led him to the University of Ingolstadt. There, chance, or perhaps some evil influence, led him to meet professors of natural philosophy, chemistry, and anatomy. He was drowning in knowledge. All he could think of was finding the cause of life. To do that, he must first have recourse to death. So he studied death in worms and frogs and cats and dogs and in the human corpse itself. Finally, a sudden light broke in upon him and he knew. The variety of feelings he encountered at this discovery bore him onwards like a hurricane. He would break through the bounds of life and death, pour a torrent of light into the dark world. Many happy and excellent beings would owe their lives to him as their creator. He might even, in time, renew life, offering life after death to the mortal world. This was his hope, and he had dedicated his soul to it. The moon gazed on his midnight labors as he pursued nature to her hiding places. He dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave, tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay. A restless, almost frantic impulse urged him forward. Relentlessly, he collected the parts from dissecting rooms and slaughterhouses until his body grew weaker, even as the creatures grew stronger. Then came that dreary night of November. Then came that dreary night of November. That dreary night of November. On a lonely road, doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. The next morning, in fear and trembling, Victor Frankenstein returned to his apartment, not knowing if the creature might still be there, alive and walking about. His hands on the lock of the door, he paused. A cold shivering came over him, he threw the door forcibly open and stepped fearfully inside. The apartment was empty, freed from its hideous guests. Assured that his enemy had fled, he clapped his hands for joy. Oh, my dear Frankenstein, how glad I am to see you. How 
fortunate that you should be here at the very moment I arrived here to Geneva. <laughs> but you haven't come just to see me. Oh, no, no. I'm a student, just like you. How did you ever persuade your uh, pragmatic parents? <laughs> You may easily believe how great was the difficulty to persuade my father that all necessary knowledge is not comprised in the noble art of bookkeeping. His constant answer to my unweary pleas were, I have 10,000 florins a year without Greek. I hold to live without Greek. <laughs> oh, I do miss your father. But come and sit down. Tell me how you left my father and brothers, and Elizabeth, of course. Very well, and very happy. Only a little uneasy that they hear from you so seldom. Elizabeth, in particular, wonders when you'll be up to writing. <laughs> by the by, I do mean to lecture you a little upon the account myself. It's... Forgive me, I must say something, for you look so thin and pale. Like, you haven't slept for days, and yet you seem so... Oh, you have guessed right. I have uh, lately been so uh, deeply engaged in one occupation that I, uh, I haven't allowed myself sufficient rest, as you can see. But I hope, I, oh, I certainly hope that all of that is in the past now. <laughs> Don't you see, Henry? I'm free! I'm finally free! <laughs> I see you're indeed ill. What for God's sake is the matter? Victor! Tell me what has happened! Please, do not ask me! Please! But one change has taken place in our little household. Do you remember on what occasion Justine Moritz entered our family? She was a great favourite of yours, I believe. The most grateful little creature in the world. And a great help to your mother. Since going away, she's now returned to us. And I must also say to you a few words of little darling William. I wish you could see him. He's quite tall for his age with... Sweet, laughing blue eyes, dark eyelashes, and curling hair. And now I have written myself into better spirits, but I'm still worried. So write, dearest Victor. One line, one word will be a blessing to us. Dear, dear Elizabeth. I must write to her at once. She loves you, Victor. You know that, don't you? And I adore her. She is everything a man could ask for. Oh, Henry, I have been foolish beyond reason. But all of that is in the past now. I will write to her of my plans. Your plans? <laughs> Our plans. It is time for you to get some fresh air. Besides, I'm tired of being a nursemaid, Victor. So finish your letter. And I'll arrange for a trip outside of this wretched town. Six years you've toiled at your studies. They have made you ill. Six years is too much for anyone to study anything, much less chemistry and biology. Finish your letter and let us quit this horrid place. Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. We rest. A dream has power to poison sleep. We rise. One wandering thought pollutes the day. We feel, conceive or reason, laugh or weep. Embrace fond foe, or cast our cares away. It is the same, for be it joy or sorrow, the path of its departure still is free. Man's yesterday may ne'er be like his morrow, not may endure, but mutability. Everything changes. 
Father. Father. Oh, Victor. <laughs> William is dead. But how? My sweet child. So gentle. Father, <laughs> tell me. Tell me. What has happened? Was it an accident? What has happened? He is murdered. <laughs> the evening was warm and serene, so we walked farther than usual. It was already dusk before we thought of returning, and then we discovered that William and Ernest were not to be found. We didn't worry, they were together. But then Ernest, only Ernest, came asking if we had seen his brother. William had run away to hide, you see, but Ernest searched for him, and he and we waited, and Arthur, we searched. Elizabeth thought I might have returned again. He was not there. We returned to the Woods of Torches. How could I rest when William was lost? Lost exposed with the damps and dews of night. What happened? Father, tell me! We found him there in the woods, my lovely boy. Night before I'd seen him blooming in perfect health. And there he was, in the grass, motionless, the print of the murderer's finger on his neck. Oh, oh, oh God, Victor, my boy is dead. Dear lovely child, he now sleeps with his angel mother. One only consolation have we. The pang is over and his sufferings are at an end forever. He can no longer oh, be quiet, quiet, please. Oh God, what have I done? Elizabeth, oh, Elizabeth, my brother is dead, dead because of me. No, Victor, you mustn't blame yourself. But if only I could tell you, you just don't know. No one knows but the two of us. We've killed him, but I am most to blame. Yes, I too blame myself at first, but it's too horrible. You don't know. What do you mean? Don't know what? The murderer's been discovered. The murderer discovered? Good God, how could that be? It is impossible. I saw him too, just now. He is free. I do not know what you mean, son. It is not he who killed our William. It is Justine. Justine? No one believed it at first, and even Elizabeth will not be convinced, notwithstanding all the evidence. Indeed, who credit that Justine Moritz, that girl your sweet mother and I brought home and treated her own child. But several circumstances came with almost force of guilt upon us and her behavior. I fear there is no room for doubt. I still can't believe it. Not Justine! On the morning William was found, Justine had taken ill and confined to bed for several days. In the pocket of her dress, a servant found a silver locket. Very valuable and antique. They say she killed him. Killed our William for it. How could she do this? It, it, it cannot be Justine. I know the murderer. He's, it, it cannot be Justine. I too rely oh, on her I... innocence as certainly as I do my own. What is to become of us now that we've lost not only that lovely darling boy, but this poor girl too? She is condemned, but she should say she will not be condemned and, and I shall be happy again. Poor William, Justine, no! She is innocent, sweet Elizabeth, and that shall be proved. I shall see to that. Only God knows how entirely I am innocent. It happened like this. I passed the evening of that horrible night at the house of my aunt. Upon my return at about nine o'clock, I met a man who asked if I had seen the lost child, William. Oh, William. I was terrified and spent hours looking for him. I looked everywhere, but then the gates of the city were shut and I was forced to remain in the barn for the night. I couldn't sleep, but must have, somehow, because towards morning some steps disturbed me and I woke. It has been said I was seen to where his body lay and that I seemed bewildered and strange. 
I was. Felt bewildered and so strange. I hardly slept, I was sick with worry. Oh dear God, help me! I don't know how the log it came to be in my possession. I had no power of explaining it. Did the murderer place it there? I know not. I only know I love little William like a brother, like a son. I could not have killed him, I did not. But I am so tired and alone. How can I go on? Justine Moritz, the sentence of this court is that you will be taken from here to the place from whence you came, and there be kept in close confinement until the date of your execution, and upon that day you be taken to the place of execution and there hang by the neck until you are dead. And may God have mercy upon your soul. Now that I am here, I don't know why I have come to this horrid place, although I wanted to know why, but no answer could ever suffice. <laughs> William is dead. You have confessed. Why did you rob me of my last hope? In court you claimed your innocence and I relied on it, and although I was wretched, I'm not so miserable as I am now. Begun to crush me, kill me. Do you condemn me too? Why do you kneel if you are innocent? I believed you guiltless, notwithstanding every evidence. Now you declare your own guilt. I did confess, I did. Forgive me, forgive. I was afraid. They said I would burn in hell forever. Burn forever if I did not confess what I have done. What I have not done. My confessor comes in the night. In the night. My confessor. My confess. You are innocent. I know you are. He did it. What can I do? I no one to help me. In the evil hour, I gave them the lie that they wanted so they could kill me and be at peace in their minds. So they will burn. Burn. I will die. Die to cover my sin. To cover their sin. Whose sin? Yours? I will die, but I will not burn. I am guilty. She is not. Please, my dear sweet lady. The blood's on my You don't believe your Justine did this all. None but the devil himself could have done this. No, he is more convinced of your innocence than I, for when he heard that you had confessed, he, he did not credit it. I truly thank you, both of you. How sweet your affection is for me. You both believe me innocent? And I can die in peace. Goodbye, dearest Elizabeth, my beloved and only friend. Live. And be happy, and make others so. Oh, Justine, what grief has been brought to you? All, all the work of Frankenstein's hands. These are not your last tears, Elizabeth. You shall yet again raise the funeral wail, and the sound of your cry shall again and again be heard. Now. Spend your vain sorrow upon the graves of William and Justine, his first victims. Wandering spirits, if indeed you do wander, 
and do not rest in your narrow graves. And allow me this faint happiness. Who's there? Devil, do you dare approach me? Vengeance will be mine. I will trample you to dust for what you have done. One thing I ask of you, just one thing. Do it and I will leave you all people at peace. Refuse, and I shall glut the jaws of death. I shall satisfy them with their blood and with yours. You monster! Let's be calm! Let me go! I am your creator! And I am your creature! You will listen to me! I was good! I was good! Make me happy and I shall be good again. In the beginning, my soul glowed with love. But now I am alone, miserably alone. It was this misery that made me a monster. They all despised me. You, you made me, but even you hate me. Who else could love me? It is in your power to satisfy me and save all mankind. In your courtrooms, the guilty are allowed to speak in their own defense before they are condemned. Well, so should I. Listen to me and then try to destroy me if you dare. You have left me no power to consider whether I am just or not. We can be nothing but enemies. Now get out of here and leave me alone. Yes, I will leave. But first hear my tale. Decide if I will live a good life or become a curse to all mankind. Your curse, Frankenstein, made by your own hand. <sighs> Heaven help me. I gave you life. <sighs> Very well. I will hear your wretched tale, and then I will curse the day you were born. I awoke from the darkness of a dozen deaths to searing light and painful life, bawling like all babes, but with no mother's arms to hold me. I was cold, but no one was there to cover me. I was hungry, but no one fed me. And so I found food and cover for myself. But still, I was so cold and alone. I found a fire, felt its heat. I put my hand in the flame to warm it until I smelt the burning flesh. No one was there to tell me it would burn, you see. And so I learned about the world, pain, Nothing but pain and hunger. One day, I came upon a village. I heard the children playing, the women laughing. They seemed so happy. I wanted to be with them, a part of them. And then I smelt wonderful food and went into the hut to eat. But a little child, a beautiful little child playing on the dirt floor saw me and screamed. <laughs> I did not mean to scare her, but I did not know how poorly I was made. How hideous you had made me. More children screamed. The men and women came with stones to hurl at me and sticks to beat me and guns to shoot me. I ran into the forest to hide. I rested by a brook that fell into a clear, still pool. Then dipping my hand in the water to drink, and soothe my bruised and broken flesh. I saw it. I saw my face. Oh God, no wonder why they screamed. I am so terrible and horrible to behold. There was a man, old and blind, who lived in a simple hut with a family who brought him food and cared for him. And he cared for them, playing on his guitar and singing. They were poor, but happy together. At night, I would watch through the cracks in the walls and listen to them talk. And so I learned how to speak and even to read. I saw how kind they were to each other. And so I was kind to them. I saw after gathering food and wood for the fire. It was my secret gift. They were happy to receive it. 
and called me a good spirit. Yes, my spirit was good then. Because the, the villagers hurled stones at me, I was afraid to make myself known to this family I loved. But maybe the old man who could not see my horrible face, maybe he would be my friend. And so one day when the others were gone away, I made myself known to him as he played on his guitar. The song was so sweet. It drew me to the door. I knocked. He told me to enter. I talked to him and he talked to me. Man to man. He pitied me. And then the family returned and saw me. They yelled at me, they cursed at me. I fell at the blind man's feet and begged for mercy, but no mercy came. They beat at me, tore at me, and drove me away. And then they left me, left me alone. I could have killed them all, but I had not yet tasted the sweetness of revenge. My life in the woods went on, wandering like an animal, eating sleeping where I could. And one day, as I was drinking near a rushing stream, I heard voices and saw a tiny child crossing on a log. She was innocent and beautiful, laughing and running from someone in cheerful play. She slipped and fell into the water. Without thinking, I jumped in and drug her to shore. I looked down at her lifeless body and she moved, she was alive. But then she opened her eyes. For a few seconds, I thought she would smile at me, thank me, but she opened her eyes, saw me, and screamed, and screamed, and screamed. I ran into the forest, heard a loud, horrible noise, and then felt pain in my side. The father had shot me. I saved his daughter, and this was my reward. All those weeks in the woods, as I healed my own wound, I nursed my anger, felt it grow. Any goodness in me replaced by hatred for the one who made me. And so I came to find you and end your life, Frankenstein. Instead, I found a boy, innocent, and beautiful, too young to reject me. He would be my friend. I had hope again, a chance for happiness. But he would not be my friend. He kicked me, mocked me, screamed at me. And so I silenced your brother forever. I squeezed the life out of him. Stop, stop. When I heard the girl calling his name, William, William, I followed her, waited until she slept in the barn, and then placed a locket I had torn from the boy's neck there to be found. No, please, stop, no more. William, Justine. I have heard your wretched tale, and I will hear no more. Why not kill me? I need you. I am alone, have always been alone. No one can stand to be near me, but one as deformed and horrible like me would not reject me. This being you must create. You must make a female for me, someone I can live with, someone I can love. This you alone can do. I demand it. You must not refuse. I do refuse it. You killed my brother. Let someone be kind to me, and I would do good for all of my days. Just one who can love me. You are evil. You have done great evil. Nothing you have said or done justifies creating another thing like you. Then revenge it will be. You shall die slowly, wondering when I will strike. How will I do it? You won't know until death is upon you. You shall cry out for mercy, but it will not come. And this is how you hope to win my heart. Create a woman for me. And for her sake, I would make peace with all the world. We will be monsters, cut off from everyone and everything, but we will have each other. I wish I could Make me happy! Do this one thing, do one thing, and I swear I will leave forever. How could I trust you? I, 
Look at all you've done. My crimes are the children of my loneliness. The love of another will destroy them. I consent. Please forgive me, I will do it. Go home then. Begin your work. Just know that I will be watching. Thus he returned home, and entering the house, presented himself to the family. His haggard and wild appearance alarmed them, but he answered no question. Scarcely did he speak. He felt as if he had no right to claim their sympathies or enjoy their companionship. And yet, to save them, he resolved to dedicate himself to the most abhorred task. The prospect of creating another monster made his existence pass before him like a dream. <laughs> My dear son, I'm happy to see that you resumed your former pleasure and seem to be returning to yourself. And yet you avoid us. Even now we all need each other so much. I was determined to stay silent on this, but I cannot. <clears throat> I confess that I always look forward to your marriage with our dear Elizabeth, now more than ever. You were attached to her from your earliest infancy when we brought her home to live with us. You studied together and appeared entirely suited to one another. You, perhaps, regarded your sister without any wish she might become your wife. Perhaps of another. Is that why you hesitate? My son, I just want you to be happy. We have all too long lived in misery. Father, I. Reassure yourself. I have never met any woman like Elizabeth. I love her. This makes me happier than I ever thought I could be again. <laughs> Marry her now. Do not suppose to dictate your happiness without a delay or causing any serious uneasiness. It's your happiness I long for, and that is all. Elizabeth! I love you. Say you will be my friend forever. Say you will be my wife. Yes, oh yes! Remember your promise. Your promise, Victor. What is it, Victor? You must calm yourself. These events have affected us. God knows how deeply. But do not despair. I see it in your eyes, my love. Despair and revenge. Oh, Victor, banish these dark feelings. Remember the friends around you who center all their hopes in you. Oh. I do remember. I do. But don't you understand? That is why I live in this misery. While we love, while we are true to each other here in this land of beauty, we can, we will find peace again. Love you, Elizabeth. I will marry you. We will live and be happy. There will be laughter again. I believe you. But, oh, how I wish it were not so. With everything that has happened, you forget that I am a scientist, Elizabeth, a student of chemistry. I was on the verge of a discovery so incredible that I. I must return. There are instruments, other scientists, teachers, people who can help me. Go to England, but you're in no state. Don't you understand? I am in this state because I have left my task unfinished. I can brook no more delay. My illness, William, Justine. I must return. Then marry me now and I shall go with you. No, I do love you, but let me go alone. Very well, I shall let you go, but not alone. You must take Henry with you. But I can't I take... could not bear the thought of you being alone while you are in such a state of despondency. Please, Victor, take your friend with you. So be it.
And so he traveled, knowing the creature would be watching him, haunted by what he must do. But his companion's joy at his surroundings was infectious. Henry was alive to every new scene, joyful when he saw the beauty of the setting sun, and even happier when he beheld it rise a new day. He pointed out the shifting colors of the landscape and the appearance of the sky. Then, even Frankenstein, depressed and agitated with thoughts of his task undone, gazed into the cloudless blue sky and drank in tranquility. <laughs> this is what it is to live! <laughs> now I enjoy my existence. <laughs> but you, Frankenstein, why are you still so... Sorrowful and despondent. I have seen so many astonishingly beautiful places, but this, this pleases me more than all those wonders. Look at that castle, almost concealed among the foliage of those beautiful trees. And now that group of laborers, and that village, up here, on the recess of the mountain. <laughs> oh, surely the spirit that God inhabits this place is in total harmony with man. <laughs> oh, Henry, your exuberance knows no bounds. Yours is a friendship of such wondrous devotion. It can only be found in the imagination. <laughs> <laughs> and you, who call yourself a man of science, is secretly full of gushing sentiments. But his walks seem to do you good, and I have never been happier, so I will allow your spontaneous overflow of emotion. Oh, you will allow it? Yes, I am the master now. You are my slave. I could pass my time here. Among these mountains, I should never miss Switzerland and the Rhine. Yes, you should stay here, Henry. You know I am to meet this Scottish fellow. This, uh, the scientist who will help me with my chemical experiments. I would like to take this tour alone. Oh, but, Elizabeth, your father... I do not wish me to be alone. Yes, I know. But sometimes a man must be alone to grieve. Enjoy yourself, my friend. I may be gone a while. A month or two, even. That long? And do not interfere. Please, leave me in peace and solitude. When I return, well, I hope it will be with a lighter heart. Much like yours, my friend. I had rather be with you in your solitary rambles than with these Scotch people. Oh, well, hurry back then, my friend. I cannot feel at home until you do. Frankenstein, my slave. My wife. This is wicked. This is wicked. No. I cannot do it. No. I cannot do it. No. Never again will I create another like you. Never. You are my creator. Start again. Make me a mate. Make me a wife. Do it or I will. You do not threaten me. Never again will I commit an act of such wickedness and set loose upon the earth another demon like you. So each man may find a wife, 
and each beast have a mate. But I am left alone. Man, you hate me for a demon. Well, here he is, with nothing but revenge to sustain him. It is revenge he seeks, dearer than light or food. Yes, only revenge remains, and so you will die. I am not afraid to die, but you first. After I see you wallow in the misery you have created. <laughs> Why wait? Try and kill me now. <laughs> No! I will not. Now is not the time. But you shall suffer horribly. I promise. And know this. I will be with you on your wedding night. On his wedding night. That, then, was the period fixed for the fulfillment of Frankenstein's destiny. In that hour, he would die, at once satisfying and extinguishing the great evil he had brought into the world. Home. Back to Geneva. To his father. To Elizabeth. That was all he could do. What he must do. The hellish creature was bent on revenge. No one knew what he would do, yet before he departed, there was a task to perform on which he dare not reflect. The next morning at daybreak, he summoned sufficient courage and unlocked the door of the laboratory. The remains of the female creature lay scattered on the floor, and he had felt as if he had mangled the living flesh of a human being. It sickened him. He put the pieces into a basket with a great quantity of stones and threw them into the sea, listening to the gurgling sound as it sank. Where am I? I was on a boat and I had just... How did I get here? You will know that soon enough. Maybe you have come to a place that won't prove much to your test, but no one cared to consult you about your partners, I promise you. Oh, why do you answer me so roughly? Surely it is not the custom of the English to receive strangers so inhospitably. I do not know what the custom of the English may be, but it is the custom of the Irish to hit villains. Villain? Villain? My God, what has he done? Who he? Don't you mean you? What have you done, mister? But here is Mr. Kerwin. You can give him your account. Why am I to give an account? Is this not a free country? I know. Free enough for honest folks. But there was a gentleman found murdered here. For that, you must give account. Sir, my name is Edward Cowan, magistrate of this district. Come with me, if you please. God, Henry, my only friend. He did it all right. Look at him. He's got that nasty, brutish look about him, sir. No, ma'am. I do not believe he did it. This is not the grief of a murderer. He swooned before when he saw the men laid out there, horrified at what he had done, laying here crying out murder in his dreams. It's guilt. But he's better now. I saw that. Ready to stand trial, he is. Aren't you all better now, sir? I know nothing, except that I still live. If it all be true, if I did not dream it, then I am sorry to still be alive. I dare say it would be better if you were dead. It should go easier for you, that's for sure. But that's none of my business. In this, I agree with you, madam. You can go now. I was sent here to nurse him, get him well. I've done my duty with a safe conscience. It would be best if everyone did the like. Impertinent woman! I fear that this place must be very shocking to you. Is there anything I can do to make you more comfortable? I, I thank you, but there is no comfort to me on the earth. 
I know that the sympathy of a stranger can be of little relief to one bored down such as yourself. But you, I hope, will soon quit this melancholy abode. I know that you are innocent. Oh, that is my least concern. After all that I have done, I... After all that I have lost, I... How could death be an evil to me? Most unfortunate and strange indeed, young man. You were thrown by some surprising accident upon this shore, seized immediately and charged with murder. The first sight to meet your eyes was the body of your friend murdered and placed by some fiend across your path. No wonder you look so ill. I found this letter among other papers found on your person when you were first brought here. From my father? Oh, this suspense is a thousand times more worse than the most horrible event. Uh, tell me what new scene of death has been acted in, whose murder I am now to lament. Your family is perfectly well, and you will see them soon. But how? While you have been ill, I, believing so strongly in your innocence, have found witness to place you elsewhere the night your friend died. Some fiend has tried to implicate you in this murder, but you could not have done it. And I have seen with my own eyes how you reacted to the horror of seeing your friend's body. I regret that cruelty, sir. I will convince the courts to release you. They will listen to me. What? You may I... go back to your family. You are free. I have arranged transport for you to return to Geneva tomorrow. What is the matter? Have you not heard me? Oh, yes. I know, you poor friend. Some horrible destiny hangs over me. I must live to fulfill it. Or surely I should have died on the coffin of Henry. Yes, you must live. Where there is life, there is hope. You will forgive me, sir, but I took the liberty to read some letters while I was looking for evidence, of course, and see reason to hope that life will be sweet again. And her name is Elizabeth. I will be with you on your wedding night. You will not kill me then. However, I will not let you win. I will live and be happy. Ah! Frankenstein believed the creature would employ every art to destroy any glimpse of happiness and take his creator's life. Be it so, thought Frankenstein, let there be a deadly struggle, victorious or vanquished. Either way, he knew it would end on his wedding night, and he would be at peace. I am afraid little happiness remains for us on earth. Shh, hush, Victor. All that I enjoy now is centered in you. Did you ever think we could be happy again? I have one secret, Elizabeth. A dreadful one. If I tell you, you will wonder how I survived it. I do not know if I should tell you. What will you think of me? There is nothing you can say that will alter my feelings for you. Tell me and be at peace. Let me taste the freedom and quiet from despair this one day. Tomorrow, I will tell you. Be happy then. No worries, no cares, nothing to trouble you tonight. What is it, Victor? What's wrong? <laughs> Listen to me. You must stay here. But, but, uh, stay here, I tell you. Promise me you will not leave no matter what you hear. What do you mean? You're frightening me. He will not kill me. Not now. I want to live. Victor! 
<laughs> Elizabeth, wife, shall I let you go? But do not scream, do not try to run. If you do, I will catch you and snap your neck like a twig. And your husband's too when he comes to rescue you. Do you understand? Do you understand? You too look at me with disgust. Whose fault is that? I am creature, not creator. Your husband made me thus. Your husband created me. I don't believe you. You know his studies, his desires. All those months and years away from you, not once thinking of you, only about me, giving me life. Leave me alone, Victor would never hit I've I found these as laboratory, where he made me and left me to die. Read them. Everything is there. Every little detail of how he made me into this disgusting thing that grips you now. Do you like what your husband has made? Justine? Oh God, Henry? Why did he make me? Why did he leave me? Why? Why? God made man beautiful in his own image, but my form is filthy. Even God's enemies had companions, fellow devils, but I am left alone. He left me. He left me. You killed them all. What are you doing? I'm writing your story. <coughs> it's tragic, of course, but you know me now. You know why I put myself and these men in extreme danger. You, a man of science, should understand like no other. Don't you see what you've done? You've created life. <laughs> Better done through my wife, I think. <laughs> if you could just give me the particulars on your creature's formation. I wish you still had your notes. Are you mad? Look at me. They are gone. <coughs> Gone because of me. Dead because of me. There's one thing left to do. I must destroy the creature. That is all there's left to do. Rest. Rest. I should have destroyed him. But I have failed. I will die and he will live. If it will give you peace, I shall seek him out and destroy him myself. No. Let it be. <coughs> Avoid ambition, Captain Walton. Seek happiness and live. Victor! Victor! Doctor! Doctor! No. No! I'm sorry. Wake up and hear me. I'm sorry. Tell me that you forgive me. You, it's you. You killed him. Yes, I killed him. I killed them all. Did you weep? I pitied him. I did. I would have let him be. I would have let him go, but he had her, you see. His Elizabeth. I had no one, no one. You weep only because your last act of revenge has been no. stolen it's from It's not you. true. When I was born, sprung full form to hideous life. 
I sought someone who could love me, someone who could see what was inside me, nor my thoughts of honor and devotion. But now I am worse than an animal, a devil. Love and fellowship was all I wanted. Still, you hated me. Was there no injustice in this? Am I the only criminal? You all hated me. I tried to help, but you drove me away. I saved that girl, saved her, and yet you tried to kill me. You humans who should be better than me. I am wretched. I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have strangled the innocent, destroyed my creator. There he lies, gray and cold in death. You all hate me, but not as much as I hate myself. Do not fear. Soon the night will be over. Soon I shall no longer see the sun or stars or feel the winds play on my cheeks. Light, since will pass away. Long ago, when I felt the cheering warmth of the summer and heard the rustling of the leaves and the warbling of the birds, I should have wept to die. But now, where can I find rest but in death? burning miseries will be extinct. I shall ascend my funeral pile triumphantly and exult in the agony of the torturing flames. The light of this fire shall fade away. My spirit will sleep in peace. Farewell. He sprang from the cabin window as he said this, upon the ice rock which lay close to the vessel. He was soon borne away by the waves and lost in darkness and in distance. Why, Mary! Oh, this is lovely! Lovely and positively frightful! A wonderful effort, my dear. Charming. Charming? I think Mary's story deserves a prize of sheer terror with it. Perhaps Mary's story is not bad. Not bad at all. But you know, I haven't finished my story yet. Uh, you haven't even started. I... My dear Shelley, neither of you. I don't need to. I will help Mary with hers. You will. Yes, my love. It is a tolerably good story, but it could be better. I believe with my help, it could even be published. I would have to write the preface, uh, filling in the blank, so to speak, to appeal to the more reasonable mind. Uh, something like this. I have thus endeavored to preserve the truth of the elementary principles of human nature, while I have not scrupled to innovate upon their combinations Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, something like that. It's brilliant. I... Let's go sailing. <laughs> sailing. Yes. Now that there's a break in this ghastly weather. Come. I'll help you with the changes to your. Pardon moi. Mary Storm. <laughs> Good man. Yes. You help, and I'll add you and all of our friends to the preface. Okay. Here you go. The season was cold and rainy, and we occasionally amused ourselves with some French. German. <laughs> He's correct, French. German, translated into French. Or is it the other way around? Um, some ghost stories of some sort. One of the groups suggested that they all write tales of horror. Two of the group's more established writers would write the tales, making the collection more acceptable to the public. Uh, acceptable to the public? <laughs> that may be a poor choice of words, eh, George? <laughs> <laughs> And now, once again, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. I had an affection for it because it was the offspring of happy days, when death and grief were but words which had no true echo in my heart. Its pages speak of many a walk in the woods, 
many a drive in the country, many a journey over the mountain when I was not alone. <laughs>